let's give a welcome to dr vasant yeah good morning everybody sorry for the like delay with that uh we'll first introduce aap video shuru kar sakte hain thank you uh we'll first introduce him in uh, what so we usually do introductions in a very embarrassing way where i don't know you and i ask you question as to who are you so <laughs> you take the mic if you can basant uh, you are an infectious disease specialist we all know that and he started life as an internal medicine guy but found that internal medicine is a very boring branch so he specialized why did you specialize in id so internal medicine is the most challenging branch i would say and still today is the most challenging the mo- among all i think uh, i would say pediatrics and internal medicine both md pediatrics and md internal medicine without specialization is the most challenging branch and uh, most adorable branch i would say uh, to to share these are all gps so they are do both yeah so <laughs> so uh, exactly so the same thing and uh, so uh, after but i had lot of interest uh, towards uh, infectious disease right uh, from uh, i completed my md medicine and i used to be only taking lectures only on uh, something i don't know what but i used to take lectures only in something to do with in the beginning with malaria dengue and you know infection related and i started developing more and more interest in infections and i decided one day that i had to do uh, my infectious disease i tried in multiple places but finally i got a bell from apollo chennai and then i left my practice for one and a half years and then i went and did my infectious disease at apollo chennai and then i was at six to eight weeks at us just for observer and then i came back and then at what age did you go to apollo so what was your uh, age at the age of 43 44 you never admitted uh happy married life i hope yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i was just I think the yeah there is some uh, resistance but I think the little acceptance and now everything is good and uh, currently you do both hospital based and outpatient infectious disease or just hospital based no so uh, I put uh, so I'm attached to Neelavathi hospital and at HN Reliance now both the places where I do both outpatient as well as indoor and i got my own clinic uh, where i do outpatient but that is for a couple of hours two or three hours but primarily i'm more into hospital based practice and for a short time i have my own practice which has been there for last 22 23 years so i'm continuing that. so what happens if an internal medicine patient without infectious disease comes to your opd so uh, internal me- if i usually uh, but there are some you know old uh, patients mm-hmm. like who have been there with me for 25 years and they sit in my clinic for say 2 hours 2 and a half hours and then i just tell them to tell them ki you go away in spite of me knowing having the knowledge of that so it doesn't look good so sometimes i see them but then slowly i push them to the respective field do you do a lot of opd tb and hiv also yes tb and hiv both yeah. hiv is my specialty hiv is the uh, core id branch because only uh, id person can really understand hiv properly Okay, that's, that's a core ID branch. Okay. So, uh, what is uh, what is an indoor practice? What is your principal area of work? Is it post-op, peri-op, meningitis? What? So, I see everything like right from uh, community-acquired infections. I see all community-acquired infections like uh, dengue, malaria. Everything I see. apart from that uh, all intensive care unit uh, infections whatever icu infections i see then uh, uh, all surgical sites post surgical infections all the ductal implant infection orthopedic infection neuro surgical infection everything uh, but my main interest is uh, in infections in uh, immunocompromised patients that is hiv and transplant id so my uh, may i'm focusing now i went from medicine to id general id then uh, i'm i'm diverting myself more towards of course i'm seeing everything i see infection i can't escape the being in a tertiary care center but uh, that transplant id is something which is very challenging and it is uh, completely because they are completely immunosuppressed there are a lot on immunosuppressant medications and all that so the whole body immunity is changed the b cell t cell so i'm trying to you know i and I, i want to give i want to get into more challenging those ones When are you leaving house again for that? 
Now I think it's the time of retirement now. <laughs> okay, we'll play a quiz here. All of you have notebooks and pens. Uh, questions from 1 to 10. So against number 1, you write the answer. We will match your answer with Sir's answer and see how many of you can be, you know, almost like him. Uh, the first question is, which antibiotic do you think would be Dr. Basant's first line drug in uncomplicated lower urinary tract infection in the young female? Which antibiotic would be Sir's first line drug in uncomplicated UPI? In uh, so please write it down against number one. It will be done. Let's hear your answer. So, in a young female, uncomplicated. Young female, uncomplicated. Cystitis, symptomatic with fever. With fever? Maybe fever, low grade fever, suprapubic pain, dysuria, pus cells, 40 50. Culture not done because it is not usually indicated. Yeah, so I would definitely send culture apart from that, but I would start her on. Uh, I would avoid doing quinolones in clinical practice because of the TB. And the choice would be either to use uh, nitrofurantan, but if there's fever, then I would use a uh, second or third generation oral subscription. Uh, <coughs> maybe I think the best choice, uh, what normally I use in my clinical practice for uh, uh, urine tract infection, where I don't want to go wrong, is using a uh, amo amoxicillin clavulinate. Okay, so his first choice, amoxicillin clavulinate. Anybody has written that? Only one person, two person. Okay. So, uh, what traditional teaching in textbooks is that there are three lower UPI approved drugs in the US: nitrofurantoin, phosphomycin, and uh, cotrimoxazole or trimethyltryptamine alone. Uh, and of course, uh, he, as he said, since he, the patient has fever, he probably would be a little more aggressive. Uh, let us discuss lower UPI first and uh, uh, ask him. So, lower UPI your opinion on when to send culture or is it a blanket send culture so uh, is the patient you're asking the patient has come to a patient young female 26 year old maybe honeymoon cystitis has come to me with dysuria no fever urine showing 60 80 pus cells there is uh, suprapubic pain will you send culture or you may not send culture? so uh, culture is a culture so for me, sending culture is a culture. So, you know, <laughs> so without that, it's not possible to treat. So uh, normally, uh, whether the patient comes in the afternoon or if daytime is not a problem at all. All of you can just ask the patient to go to the lab and send culture. But the most, most challenging part comes when the patient is sitting in your OPD at 10 o'clock in the night and the patient, suppose this girl enters in my room at 10 o'clock in the night and then says these are the symptoms. Then as I said, culture is a culture. So how do I get the culture done in the Still midnight, midnight and you know, start the antibiotic? So usually uh, either you can keep sterile continuous in your, uh, in your OPD. I think that's the best practice you can do, I think. Because the most common uh, community acquired practice is zero success. So you can keep the, the sterile continuous from the whatever particular lab. What I do is tell them to collect the urine sample in the night itself. Okay. Because I want to, I don't want to wait till next day morning to start an antibiotic when I know the patient is already in symptoms. So why to make that patient suffer with dysuria and fever and chills and all? It's quite an unpleasant uh, experience. So uh, what I do is I tell them to collect the urine sample and the sample I tell them to store it in the refrigerator, not in the deep freezer, just the refrigerator four degrees. Start the antibiotic that same way. So your job is done, your urine sample has been collected for the culture and you then you can start the antibiotic. Either you can do uh, cefiroxime or cefixime or amoxicillin clalulic acid uh, and tell the patient that next day morning you should be able to reach this urinary sample to the lab in 30 minutes time. So so 30 minutes? 30 minutes may it should reach the lab and your job is done. So I think this practice of follow you will not go wrong because uh, there's a lot of resistance. I think it's your good question. Uh, second question to you, please write down. Which I prefer to get a mixed-in sample. Uh, that could be ideal to get a mixed-in sample. Which but uh, the timing we'll that only morning. We'll take questions after we discuss the full lower UPI. We'll take questions. Which, uh, mm, sorry, what was I asking? 
second question is which do you think is the commonest organism causing lower uti commonest organism very quickly okay everybody knows that yeah, i think all of you are correct it's the e coli uh, your comments on the current e coli situation in india especially regarding the resistance i think uh, the if you must have seen that my choice of antibiotic was uh, bl bl that is beta lactamase beta lactamase inhibitor that is amoxicillin flavulinic acid the injectable forms of beta lactamase beta lactamase inhibitor which are uh, us fda approved drugs are cefepirozin sulbactam uh, that is a european drug not us but and piperacillin tazobactam so the only oral form which is uh, us fda approved drug is amoxicillin flavulinic acid that is a beta lactamase beta lactamase inhibitor so then uh, why did i choose why didn't i choose uh, cefiroxime i why didn't i choose cefexim and why did i uh, you know uh, choose amoxicillin flavulinic acid above others is because in community there is 70% resistance to esba that is extended spectrum beta lactamase organism 70% of e coli produce 70% or 80% of the e coli which are there in the community and especially in elderly and diabetics it is 70 to 80% resistance to the second and third generation cefepirozin i think the cefexin and cefiroxim may not work so that's why uh, and uh, so i'll just explain you can you know what is yeah. esb so what is esb okay so i'll just tell you so uh, 1940s and 50s when you know the humans started manufacturing the penicillin so the organism started producing penicillin as and then so the penicillin is started for destroying the penicillin so the humans said ki you know we are more smarter so they started manufacturing semi synthetic penicillin that is ampicillin amoxicillin okay the organism became more smarter so they started producing beta lactamase enzyme okay so this beta lactamase enzyme started destroying the amoxicillin and ampicillin so human became more smarter they said ki we make a, a, a drug which is you know in a bit inhibitor ha huh? so which will inhibit this beta lactamase so they produced the or the antibiotic which is uh, uh cefalos the uh, which is uh, you know amoxicillin clavulinic acid or cefepirozin sulbactam and the piperacillin tazobactam so the organisms uh, so to inhibit these beta lactamase okay so to inhibit these beta lactamase which will destroy the second and third generation cefalosporins okay like you have uh, cefepirozin so if you use only cefepirozin injectable it will be destroyed by the beta lactamase enzyme so to first inhibit these beta lactamases you require a beta lactamase inhibitor okay and that beta lactamase inhibitor is either clavulinic acid tazobactam or sulbactam so it is cefepirozin sulbactam piperacillin tazobactam and amoxicillin clavulinic acid so this clavulinic acid tazobactam and your sulbactam will inhibit the beta lactamase enzyme and it, it will allow the cefepirozin or your piperacillin and all that to work so what i wanted to say is that in the community we have 70% of the pathogens which are extended spectrum beta lactamase inhibitors uh, uh, esb will organ it produce so this e coli 70% more than other or other those no so e coli and klebsiella both are equally uh, 60 to 70% resistant uh, but the commonest organism as all of you have said is e coli so e coli so that's the reason and i think you can get away in the younger uh, population like suppose this 27 years uh, female who had come with this urea possibly giving a second or third generation cefalus for in that is cefexim or your cefiroxim would also do it is not that every patient should be started on amoxicillin clavulinic acid you can start but what is more important you do the culture so culture will next day morning immediately you know next 48 hours will guide you to whether you are on the right track or not and in fact i would say why don't you maintain a diary of all the urine cultures you send and you know your reports you keep it and you will come to know from your own data See what is the community acquired infection? So how many are ESBM? So there is 40 percent, 50 percent, 80 percent. So it is enjoyable in your journey of your practice also to keep a data and see what is the pattern of resistance, what you are facing, and when you have your own data, that is the strongest data to defend any uh, any anywhere. So I'll just give you a little bit more 
extended spectrum beta lactamase producers chiefly are two organisms like he said streptococcus does not produce staphylococcus does not produce e coli capsiella any other organism that they should so i think all the gram negatives will be the culprit organisms like it will be enterobacter or it could be klebsiella e coli it could be seresia proteus Uh, all these uh, even pseudomonas for the for the for the example. So all the gram negatives are the one which will have the extended spectrum beta lactamase production. One gram negative, probably an exception, which does not produce beta lactamase, is Salmonella, because we don't use in typhoid, for example, we will not use clavulanate with your say, this. Salmonella does not produce. Uh, yeah, so till today it doesn't produce, but we have yeah, seen, we don't know. We have seen a couple of patients who were uh, who, who are here today. Salmonella. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So we had two patients who had tough, we had tough time in managing them, and uh, not very common. But uh, uh, I mean, I'm just uh, so. Are we going to discuss salmonella? Yeah, yeah, we have to. So we'll discuss. Okay. Uh, any question on only lower UTI? So augmentin ke badle he is asking whether Zephy CV, Zephu CV, Zosef CV can be so used. I, yeah, I, I know. See, you know, the, in the in the market there are so many cefproxim clavulinic acid, cefexim clavulinic acid, cefuroxim, cefproxim clavulinic. So a lot of these combinations are available. Uh, realistically, I have not used any of them in my clinical practice uh, because the reason is uh, when you using the amoxicillin clavulinic acid the research has been done for that that amount of amoxicillin how much clavulinic acid is required okay for say 500 mg of amoxicillin you require 125 mg of clavulinic acid similarly when you have cefaparazin selbactam you know that for 1 g of injectable magnetic force for the available commonest you know cefaparazin 1 g you require 500 mg of selbactam So when you have pepercillin tazobactam, you know that 4.5. So this for 4 gram pepercillin, you require 500 of tazobactam. Okay. But for cefproxim, cefixim, these are all Indian combinations. I am I am not against them, and I am not saying they don't use them. But it has never been validated Standard for that. For cefixim, that cefixim, how much of because this is only in India. These brands are not available internationally. All. Not US FDA approved. Yeah. So I'm not saying they may be wrong. They may be good also, but I, I'm not used because I always go by books. So uh, so what I have been teaching them is that if amoxicillin is found in TDS, you should generally use augmentin TDS. Whether that is correct or people many people write twice. It. Yeah. So 625 of uh, 500 plus 125 three times a day is correct dose. Or you can use augmentin DO, but then that is like slow release. Amoxicillin one eight. Next thing, a thousand milligram has eight seventy five one twenty. So that that is BD. BD. So augmentin BD. DO thousand eight seventy five milligram amoxicillin will be BD because then you will be effectively giving giving seventy seven similar dose huh. um, of amoxicillin. So it's also important part of the treatment, but I think most important would be to eradicate the organism. Yeah, you can alkaline it the uh, urine so that your bacterial load also gets better, your diseria also decreases. But most important would be to get rid of the organism. So uh, the, there is no limit to that actually. But for urinary tract infection, it depends. You can use it for three days, five days, seven days, depending upon the uh, the severity of the infection. You know, if it's simple cystitis, then three days is enough. If it is a fever with urinary tract infection, it would be seven to ten days. If it is proper pyelonephritis, then it will be ten to fourteen days. And if it's a complicated pyelonephritis, it would be twenty-one to twenty-eight days. So it depends upon what is the clinical scenario at that juncture. But Uh, amoxicillin clavulinic acid as as an anti is one of the minor anti tuberculous drugs okay and we have been using it for 2 years oh okay so, so safety is not a concern and in some patients we have used lifelong also like for patients who have got say implant infection okay somebody has got a implant infection and the implant is 
growing an organism which is say which is sensitive to your the patient should be really lucky to have a organism which is sensitive to oral antibiotic okay so if you are implant for some reason you cannot remove the implant because of the medical conditions or the patient does not want to remove it then once you treat the implant infection you will have to if you don't give them the suppressive therapy for longer time the organism is again going to come back and because implant means there's a biofilm form so the organisms are always hidden so keep them suppressed sometimes you may require to give 2 years 5 years life long to that thing so it's a safe drug but i'm not saying that use it for such a long time use it only what is required for 3 days or 7 days or what is required for your but since you asked me the how long you, you can that's a safe drug okay no, so madam sorry i if the patient for present with this area but the urine retention is normal can they empirically start and So if the patient is symptomatic, na, then uh, then definitely uh, I, I think you can give three days of treatment. But uh, if the patient is not symptomatic and having uh, this is that asymptomatic. We are asymptomatic. Why are we discussing? So if the patient is symptomatic, I, I think I would without fever, I would consider this cystitis, and I would just give a short course of three days treatment and come out. Uh, one more point here: if the patient has dysuria and no pyuria. you should also consider atrophic vaginitis as an option as a possibility and rule that out because that can also cause lower uti kind of symptoms yeah he is asking he went against the culture report but responded ha meaning it have many times happen for example so the same suppose this girl 27 years girl who has come to you with uh, what tushar said with fever and you know dysuria and you started the patient on cefiroxib second generation cefiroxib and next you have told her to collect the urine sample keep it in the refrigerator she does all that religiously and she comes with a report which is showing that cefiroxib is resistant Correct. That is similar to that. But you are, she is saying, doctor, whatever treatment you give, I am absolutely fine now. My fever is gone. I have no urinary complaints, nothing. So uh, I I would go clinically. What the I will not change my treatment according to the report. But I would go clinically. Whatever I have started, I will continue that. Because the reason for that is whatever uh, antibiotic you give, say for sex, especially the cephalosporins, they come in such a high concentration in the urine the concentration of those antibodies is so high that it may overcome the resistance so i would if the patient is clinically doing well i will not change my antibody because there is a fair possibility that by changing antibody it may, may or may not work so what is the working uh, regimen i would go with you will uh, you can ask the uh, doctor here and we will go to the next topic that he already said he would start augmenting no so it is 40 mg per kg body weight of amoxicillin and i think anybody above 40 kg can be given 1 gram 1 gram into say 50 kg no 4 5 0 2 so i think above 50 kg you can give full dose allergic to amoxicillin clavulin patch amoxicillin clavulin no? uh, say like there is no allergy to clavulin it as far as ha huh, there is no clavulinic acid no? it will be to the augment the it will be to the primary uh, semisynthetic penicillin that is amoxicillin yeah so do you back quickly does cranberry or so, you know demanose yeah help? so cranberry is supposed to be uh, you know preventing the attachment of these bacteria to the you know epithelial cells so that is what is the theory but uh, uh, you can use it i've seen that it many times doesn't work okay, so the last question it is a good drug i there is no harm it's a 
uh, it is a fruit so why should you not eat it you please you should try that and sometimes even i do that okay thank you you asking one, will one oral dose affect the culture one single dose is good enough to not get you the cultures are even typhoid positive no no i am not saying so no, you will he says if the patient comes to him after taking antibiotic suppose if i am the suppose this patient has come to me and i uh, irrationally not then the urine culture started something and the patient doesn't get better and comes to you you please attempt to do a culture Okay. It may come negative. That's a different. We will uh, we will hold here and we will go to the next topic. We have a lot of to finish. Uh, quick question to all of you: And will you treat asymptomatic pyuria in a non-diabetic young female? No fever, no no symptoms. Will you treat 60 to 80 per cells? Yes or no? Please write down. Please write down. So is there a black and white yes or no? Uh, asymptomatic uh, bacteria in a uh, diabetic female, uh, non-diabetic. No, no, I said non-diabetic. Non-diabetic. But uh, uh, what is the age? Young female, I said. Young female. Three men are possible, maybe. I will definitely try to do culture, especially if there is no reason for a young girl to have pyuria. So I will definitely investigate her for the pyuria, and the most commonest cause of. Uh, sometimes asymptomatic pyuria. I'm talking in a younger person, young mm -hmm. female. You know, there is no business for her to have too much of pustules. Would be to look for any uh, local issues, and second is um, uh, urogenital TB. So asymptomatic pyuria in India, a urogenital TB is very very uh, important part. And for that, you will have to send three sets of urine for AB culture, not one. Three sets of urine for AB culture. And there is another test which is available as urine for TB pyrosequencing, which you get the report in three days, and that is for urine for TB pyrosequencing. The FDA is done at Rindiga. So I think for just py many times even elderly person, you know, coming to me with pyuria, 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 not much symptomatic, but having slight, uh, then you look for any uh, you know urogenital abnormality. I'll definitely investigate this patient. What's happening? Look for the bladder tone, whether she has got cystitis or whether she has some bladder lesion. Or whether she has got an obstructed uropathy, or whether she has got a vaginal urethral reflux. So, in a young female to have pyuria, uh, even if it's asymptomatic, I'll definitely go in because this could be uh, the beginning of her renal issues, glomerulonephritis, and you know so many so things. So, what he's saying is investigate. You may or may not give antibiotics to begin with, but please investigate so that, of course, you will rule out poor collection, etc. Maybe repeat a urine sample. But you will investigate pyuria, not let it let it go. Next uh, question is: Can a family physician treat pyelonephritis, upper UTI, on an outpatient basis if the patient is not very toxic? Yes or no? What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, provided you get your organism correct, you at least attempt to get your cultures done. And at least get a ultrasound done to see that you are not missing an obstructed kidney or any. Uh, basically, uh, you should not miss a complicated pyelonephritis. By the terminology, complicated pyelonephritis means perinephric collections, renal abscesses, and uh, your obstructed kidney because of stone or in diabetics, uh, you know, you have this papilla, renal papilla. So they may just uh, necrose and get fall. They fall in the ureter and they obstruct the urinary system. So uh, definitely you can treat. So even I do that many times. Uh, if, but if the patient is diabetic and all that, then I prefer to get them admitted because you know they can behave uh, in another way. But younger people, uh, you definitely any. So what does? Uh, so there is a difference between cystitis uh, and you know pyelonephritis. So any patient with urinary infection, having fever is almost considered as pyelonephritis. That means the problem is above the bladder level. Up to cystitis usually doesn't cause fever. Okay, anything, anything fever and urinary system, I would say consider as pyelonephritis. I'm sure all of you, including me, have been treating such patients in the outpatient, and we have been successful in that. Anything is the duration of treatment. Stick to that same drug for the proper duration of at least 10 days time. Then the patient will be okay. And rule out any 
get a sonography there and see that you're not missing out any uh, complicated spinal cord. Yeah, I'm saying for oh, obstructive pathology. Uh, do not miss a complicated spinal cord. So, uh, in a suppose proven, if I do hundred patients who are on CT proven to have spinal cord, like hundred patients CT scans. So I I've, I've done a data where I've picked up all the hundred patients who have got. Spinal nephritis on the CT, and when I go and see the sonography, only 40% like what Narmi is saying. Only 40% would be showing spinal nephritis. So 60% of them will be normal. Missing. Missing. So my idea of doing a sonography in a urinary tract infection is not to miss a complicated spinal nephritis, that obstructive or you know the bladder, whether the, in a male person whether he's got prostate or prostate enlargement, or whether he's having a post residual urine. So see that you the, the patient you know you treat it and treat the primary cause also. One important thing to remember here is, as he said, sonography may not pick up. So your clinical judgment may become important. High grade fever with rigors, with maybe some flank pain, renal angle tenderness, and sometimes absence of dysuria with pyuria, meaning pyelonephritis may not show burning maturation unless there is associated cystitis. If there is such a thing, then pyelonephritis should be your diagnosis irrespective of the of the sonography and uh, as he said most important don't start an antibiotic without collecting culture and of course at least get a sonography done all complicated pyelonephritis should be hospitalized and when he said complicated he says some morphologic abnormality on sonography all pregnant pyelonephritis should be hospitalized all diabetic pyelonephritis should be hospitalized in the opd management of pyelonephritis Write down your first drug choice while you await the culture report. Your first oral antibiotic choice while you await the culture report. I'm asking them, what is your first drug of choice for suspected pyelonephritis awaiting the culture report on an OPD okay. basis? Because if they are willing to start in the OPD, then what antibody will they start while awaiting culture? Your choice. So. I have two choices. Either I use uh, TNPX, that is Tamitoprim Sulfamethoxazole, Bactrim, or sometimes, the, and the other choice is Amoxicillin Glyolinic Acid, that's what I use. So, uh, but rule out sulfa allergy before using Sepran. Sepran, you can never go wrong. You can get, no, because even in resistant uh, UTI also, your Sepran will definitely work. So, Sepran is something which is, uh, even in multi-drug resistant E. coli, which is, Carbapenem, Meropenem resistant and all that. Still you will see back pain working extremely well. So Sepran is a fantastic drug uh, and it has got a lot of advantages. My, my impression, which is obviously wrong, was that Cotinoxol can be used only in lower UTI, not in no, upper no, UTI. No, it's excellent. Excellent drug on upper UTI also. Yeah. Okay. So what he says is that it is not uh, inhibited by beta lactamases and often works in uh, even those who are resistant to Meropenem. So, augmenting versus septazone is your uh, sorry, cotimoxazole is your choice. Uh, once they are admitted, just for our knowledge, what is your first drug intravenous for pyelonephritis awaiting culture report? So, another drug which you can use is cefixin, but use cefixin 400 BD or TDS. Don't use 200 BD and Use proper dose of 400 BD or 400 TDS. That is a dose for uh, you know OPD versus pyelonephritis. With clavulinate? No, not plain, plain. plain. E. coli okay. hoega no, oh, report, culture report, we will see. We will see. Okay. No, but not. I use 400 BD. So, uh, so once, suppose if this patient uh, is, say, very toxic, and if I have to hospitalize this patient, and so whether I hospitalize at a local nursing home or, so my first choice of, uh, so one is, in the ID problem, in the infectious disease problem, uh, we have to answer six questions. One is, what is the syndromic diagnosis? The syndromic diagnosis is urosepsis. Whether it's a urosepsis or a pneumonia or a pyelonephritis or a meningitis, whatever. So here, it is urosepsis. Second question is, what are the organisms causing this syndromic diagnosis? The organism which will cause this syndromic diagnosis, 95% will be E. coli or Klebsiella. It's a gram negative. Okay. Then third question is, what is the pattern of resistance of these organisms in the community? So that third question is, it is around 70 to 80 percent resistance is there in the community, okay? And you are admitting the patient, so you cannot uh, be, uh, you know, trying uh, uh, lower antibiotics. So the, we know that 70 percent resistance. The fourth one is 
which is the best choice of antibiotic for that pathogen, for that resistance. Okay. So once you have an ESBL, uh, so first question is we know Eurosepsis, second is we know the organism, third we know the pattern of resistance, fourth is what would be the choice to combat this ESBL, we will be using, once the patient is hospitalized, I will not use oral, so definitely I will use injectable. So the first choice would be to use Cifabarazine Selvactam or use a Piperacillium Tezobactam or maybe use Ertapenem. Ertapenem is once daily. So these would be my three choices, but if you ask me what I do, 90% of the time we are using Cifabarazine Selvactam. If it's a female patient, then I use Piperacillium Tezobactam and I will tell you the reason why in females I use Piperacillium Tezobactam and in why in male patients I use Cifabarazine Selvactam. So I already made the choice. I'm not. I'm not still given the drug. Okay, I've decided in my mind that the fourth point is what drug I have to give. So I've decided either Pepezo or uh, Cefazoxel Bactam or Atapenem. The fifth question is whether uh, whatever I'm giving is it reaching that site? Okay, meaning the, is it like say nitrofurantoin? Okay, it is a good drug for cystitis, but it is not a good drug for pyelonephritis because it does not come in the kidney. It's it is get excreted in the urine. So it doesn't stay in the pylonephrine, in the renal parenchyma at all. So even if it is sensitive, it is not achieving the target what you want. Okay. So the fifth is whatever you are giving, is it reaching that site is not there. So I know that Pepecillin, Tezobacum, Superman, Gilbacum, Autopenum, all of them will be reaching the site. And six, sixth question is the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. I mean giving it in the proper full dose not giving half the dose, I am giving a full dose and give it in a whatever. Suppose if I have to give the pressure in tezobactam, then give it 8 hourly and not 12 hourly. Cephobin selbactam has to be 12 hourly and ortopenem that is, in my, uh, is 1 gram once a day. So these are the options. So, uh, for example, if the creatinine is borderline high, then you have to adjust the dosage accordingly. That means the pharmacokinetic formula. So, you have to answer all these six questions in your clinical practice. If you are faced with a difficult patient, no? I know in family practice so it's an absolute challenge. I mean, I, when a patient comes to my clinic, I know that this patient is going to sit for 30 minutes, 50 minutes. So, you know, I've got all the time in the world to, but for you, just two minutes, right? There are 100, 150 patients waiting in your outpatient department. So, you can't uh, keep there. So, but in some patients where you're stuck, possibly there, uh, you know, you they should have time. these questions. So my first choice would be to use Cifabarazine Selbactam for that. But if I'm admitting the patient, uh, I will definitely send a urine routine urine culture, but I will always send two sets of blood culture. That is a must. So two sets of blood culture means it is uh, right hand one set, left hand one set, and it will be 10 ml aerobic, 10 ml anaerobic, right hand, 10 ml aerobic, 10 ml anaerobic, left hand. So that is 40 ml of blood. So that is very, very important in your clinical practice that when a patient is admitted. So I'll tell you the reason. Suppose the patient has uh, come to you, you are given uh, the patient, say, cefiroxine, and the patient not getting better, and the patient comes to me in my hospital for admission. If I just send a urine culture, your urine culture can come negative because the cefiroxine is in such high concentration in the urine, it will inhibit the growth. So the only thing which will help me is the blood pressure. Okay. I am not saying every time your blood culture will come positive, but it, culture should be a culture. So, you know, it, it's a tradition and in uh, the nursing home, you know, where I have been practicing 25 years, uh, I don't have to tell the sisters or anything, ki you are, they know ki if I have to start an antibiotic, when I say that, please start this patient on subtraction, they know ki they have to send blood cultures and urine culture, it's a protocol. So, they have to send their pro, uh, blood cultures and I am telling you, we are able to no, we are not using carbapenems at all in our diagnosis. So hardly carbapenems, rarely it is being used because we are getting our cultures correct and we are right on the target. Yeah, so, okay, so I did not answer it. So two cultures. Why two cultures, meaning one hand, this one hand? This so one. some... Bacteria, pyelonephritis causes significant is, you, you can get your blood culture, you can get a urine culture which is negative. That is because the patient has already taken some antibiotic before they come to you, so that's why. And uh, in pyelonephritis, your blood cultures will meaning will hold you more strongly towards you. And uh, yeah, that is one thing. Why two sets? Two sets, yeah. So uh, because you know our skin has a lot of pathogens. You know, you have 
uh, streptococcus epidermidis and propanobacterium, sometimes MSCC, sometimes you have enterococcus fecalis and all that. Even on the skin, on the skin. On the skin, skin oh. our own skin. If the skin is not clean properly, so whenever you take a blood culture, it has to be the, uh, the area from where you are collecting has to be at least cleaned properly twice or thrice. The sister has to use hands up properly, use sterile gloves and then only, you yeah. know, get it. In spite of knowing all this, even in the major culturally hospitals also, you know, you'll still get all these patterns, staphylococcus and all that, coming into the blood culture, which are false positive, the skin pathogens. So when you send two sets of blood culture, you cannot try to contaminate unless the technician is really bad. So, um, you know, to contaminate both the hands. So, you one set, staphylococcus is positive, you discard it. But if, suppose, all the four bottles is growing the same pathogen, then you will have to think beyond pyelonephritis, it may be something endocarditis or something like that. So that is one. Now, why 40 ml of blood? You know, uh, actually, the more the blood you send, the chances of picking up the organism is higher. In general, when you send 100 blood cultures in a lab, okay, only 10% of them will be positive. But those 10, nine, the rest 90 don't have bacteria. You understand? Out of the 100, suppose 100 cultures have been sent, 100 patients, only 10% will be positive because the 90% don't have bacteria. So normally we always blame culture which ke kya fayda ho, so negative hai. But only 10% are bacteria and that is what we want to pick up. And actually the volume of the blood is very important when you are doing your uh, cultures uh, because the more the volume of the blood, the chances of picking up the organism is higher. For example, I, I always give this example in every meeting. So if you put your net Okay, if you put your net once into the sea, what is the chance of catching the fish? And if you put it four times, more than four times. Second is, if you have a smaller net, what is the chance of catching the fish compared to if you have a bigger net? So the bigger net is bigger volume of net, so you definitely catch the problem. So the volume of the, sometimes you require to send 60 ml, but I'm not saying that 60 ml is not a routine practice, but at least 40 ml. Question that one who I have, especially is asked, uh, being sent to me by Kumar, I think a small short question uh, that Kumar wants to answer is to, uh, what, is, what is the role of probiotics during antibiotic therapy? Role of probiotics during antibiotic therapy. So, uh, again, this uh, probiotic, no, I actually, uh, I use it when I'm using uh, clindamycin because that is known to cause uh, GI disturbance. So I'm using that. Occasionally, I use it with amoxicillin clindamycin acid. But if you ask me, uh, it's predominantly when I'm using clindamycin, uh, I use it. Or if somebody is uh, on phosphomycin, if they get loose motion, no leave then I write down. Okay, only if you get loose motion, then use it otherwise. So uh, probiotic is again not on my pen. Uh, just like steroid is not on my pen. Uh, similarly, antibiotics much are not. So uh, writing probiotics, vitamins, it's not on my pen much. So I usually more likely to be targeted therapy rather than vitamin. Uh, Another antibiotic that uh, Kumar has been asking me about is lincomycin. Uh, lincomycin, is it used by you? Is it used in India? Should it be used? So I have no experience of using lincomycin. Lincomycin for our knowledge is a clindamycin like drug, I think. Precursor of. Sorry? Precursor of. Precursor of. Precursor of lincomycin. Okay, fair enough. The question is Do you use prophylaxis for travelers diarrhea? And if so, which one? And how do you treat travelers diarrhea? Short. So normally, uh, travelers' diarrhea, uh, which happens usually, uh, uh, you know, is usually because of uh, using, uh, because of food poisoning. I would only say. Otherwise, travelers' diarrhea per se, unless you go on a ship and all that norovirus and all that. So I think travelers' diarrhea usually, I would say, usually will be with uh, uh, you know abdominal pain, cramping, usually maybe also with fever. So I think there, uh, unlike what I've been telling till today, till now. Uh, the best drug which works on travelers' diarrhea, especially infective, is ciprofloxacin. Okay. So this is the only place where I am using ciprofloxacin, but for a short duration, three days. Find it video for three days. Uh, many have seen people taking Oflox, Omnidazol, then uh, uh, Norflox, TZ and all that, and Cefexim also. But actually, it, uh, I found extraordinary good results using 
ciprofloxacin, uh, one single dose and you know patient is almost 50% better. Mm -hmm. So ciprofloxacin is one which and whenever there is acute diarrhea, no, it, it cannot be parasitic, it is never amnesic. So another thing which you should remove from your clinical practice is using combination therapies. You remove using ciprofloxacin TZ, Oflox TZ, Oflox Ornithazole, acute diarrheas are always either viral or bacterial. So I would say uh, uh, the Ornithazole, Trinazole only will cause more vomiting, nausea, uh, drug allergy, drug skin rash and what happens, many times somebody gets a skin rash no, and the patient is taking Oflox Ornithazole, then the patient is banned from using quinolones lifelong. So because we don't know whether it's Ornithazole or whether it's Oflox Ornithazole. So, uh, prefer to use, uh, don't use combination therapies at all in a clinical practice. That is something which I would advocate because you'll never know in which which direction you're going. Use single uh, single antibiotic, whatever you want to use uh, for that relevant symptom. Like for your, I, I just I said, acute travelist idea. Ciprofloxacin is, uh, you know, quickly gets you better. On, uh, we have... Uh, so you can, I can assure you 100% that not using Tindazole or Ornithazole in your clinical practice will not cause any failure. Gastroenteritis 100% I can tell you. Yes. Acute diarrhea, I can guarantee you simple, either it's viral or it's bacterial, it is that it cannot be parasitic. Either. Usually amoebic and GRDS, they are usually we chronic diarrhea, subacute chronic and they will not cause fever. Uh, they will have flatulence, abdominal discomforts and all that, you know, cramping pains. And whenever you have acute cramping pain, they are, you know, they are always acute like this. So we discuss gastroenteritis in a bit, just as after that we can ask you questions. Uh, my question next is, if Norflox was eradicated from the face of Earth, would you have heartburn? Would you be heartbroken? So I think uh, that was a drug which was actually working very well uh, for uh, gastro as well as for urine tract infection uh, earlier also. And I think in small percentage, still not flux, uh, you know, may, may not be a, may not be a good, bad choice. Uh, so so you send cultures, use not flux and possibly you may get back to your old drug. So, you know. So yeah. not using a drug for a long time may make it useful again. That that kind of thing. So we will keep it with us. Uh, we have we have we collectively have created large garbage bin where we keep uh, some of the drugs inside that garbage bin. Oh, okay. Multiple NSAIDs, multiple okay. drugs. We never you know, we've taken a vow never to use acetaminophen and things like that. So I was asking if Norflox can be added to that garbage bin, no, but no, no, not no, yet. Not, no, not no, yet. No, no. Okay. Uh, which according, please write down, which according to him would be his favorite first generation oral cephalosporin. First generation oral cephalosporin includes cephalexin and cephadroxyl. Which do you think his, is his preference? Please write it down. And then next write which would be his favorite second generation cephalosporin whenever it is indicated. Oral cephodoxime, sorry cephodoxime, cephuroxime, cephachlor or cephodoxime. Prozil, cephachlor, ceprozil, cefuroxide. Uh, what is the first generation, first choice? Cephalexin. So I've been using cephalexin in my clinical practice and it's an excellent drug for, and the indication to use cephalexin is for methicillin sensitive scap always. So skin and soft tissue infections, bone and joint infections, as a follow up therapy, uh, I'm using it. But uh, the first choice is to use cephalexin. And among the second generation, I have actually uh, gone away with it. But the drug which I used to use was cefiroxine, uh, but uh, which was very effective in the urinary tract infections and all that till 10 years back, I would say. But now it is 100% close to 100% resistance. So again, cefiroxine is out of my pen. But if you ask me what was the one which I was uh, writing, it was cefiroxine. Cefalexin, I'm still using. Uh, next question to him and your question too. Which antibiotic do you think he prefers to give to prevent secondary bacterial infection in dengue? Which antibiotic does he prefer? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, why is doxycycline still being used by some consultants in dengue? Uh, so, uh, 
uh, we are not using doxycycline. Maybe when we don't know what is the cause of fever and you send blood cultures and if there's a travel history or uh, uh, you know you're thinking about lepto during the monsoon season and all that. So then you know we don't know whether it's dengue or a lepto or a scrub type of cell. So then your doxy becomes a very very important drug which we use even in uh, hospital based practice. Uh, but uh, uh, you asked me doxycycline. Doxycycline became a fad in a dengue, dengue fraud proven yeah. NSO so, positive. So there is some reports which uh, uh, but these are anecdotal reports which talks about uh, doxycycline may be useful to reduce the toxicity in dengue but I don't think that is true. So doxy, I don't think you require any treatment antibiotic for dengue as a, it's a symptomatic treatment, completely symptomatic uh, treatment. That will bring me to antibiotic stewardship that we spoke about. Uh, just to give you a concept of what is antibiotic stewardship, basically within hospitals, each hospital has started a program of antibiotic stewardship where they have a supervisor, a steward who will keep track, it might be a team of people, who will keep track of what antibiotic we use. If the consultant writes meropenem, then they will question that meropenem prescription. They will go through the reports, see the cultures, etc. So, my request to uh, family physicians was to start their self-stewardship of antibiotics. Is there any way where uh, family physicians can get stewardship in an organized manner? Antibiotic stewardship in an organized manner. Have you I thought of <coughs> So maybe if we uh, roll out an antibiotic policy and a do's and don'ts like what we have been talking just now, I think if we have that, uh, uh, you know, maybe refraining antibiotics in from your clinical practice where it is not required, uh, like, you know, the less simply UTIs and URTIs and all that. As we just discussed, everybody is coughing in Mumbai, it cannot be bacteria, so it is 99% viral. So something of that sort, I think if you, because once you give an antibiotic, you, know, you then uh, diagnosing that fever becomes very difficult. So cultures come negative and it's really a challenge. The worst thing which happens is in salmonella type. Entry fever is, are we going to discuss yeah, entry Just next yeah. So I think uh, so antimicrobial uh, stewardship. Can, uh, can family physicians associations, so yeah. they have, she has monon, she has got cobra, she has only can they do something about it and should they be proactive? I mean, uh, like you know, Western IMA, we ourselves can have a very strong, uh, you know, uh, and I think uh, I'm seeing that Western line, all the family physicians to be very active and, you know, uh, understanding and I think definitely will follow. So I think if we start as a pilot project from Western Sandra mm -hmm. and then replicate in the. Now, who's the, the IMA currently in Western? Who's Gajaria? Is there anything uh, that can be done regarding antibiotic stewardship program through IIM? I think let's start uh, from IMA. I will take the lead for AMS. Uh, you know. If you can help, yeah, I'll take, I'll take the. I'll take. I'll you might be of help. Rolling out an AMS in family conditions. I think that's so I think is. what I think uh, this is a personal criticism which uh, I would say it now because it has been bothering me. Sit down, sir. IMA, GPA, AMC, Associate Medical Consultants, have proven to be uh, fairly inactive during COVID when so many people gave so many antibiotics. I have never seen a single newspaper ad where the IMA says, okay, or even an SMS. You know, IMA has an SMS facility. GPA has an SMS facility. Uh, Dr. Merchant, you are with GPA. Do you think any, any SMS was sent to GPs where you send SMS, right? WhatsApp messages, you have groups. No, acne, they volunteered, they did work. Have you ever given an antibiotic warning? To, and you know that antibiotics were used. So I'm saying, as an organization, did the organization do anything? Could it have done anything in retrospect? It could have. So I think some proactivity in antibiotic area whether we can, uh, because it is still a problem, URTI currently is, is, is huge, so it is still a problem and if an organization takes it up for its members, we individuals telling them can tell to so many people, we have 10,000 GPs in the city. No, but we are 50, 100 people, 200 people. I am talking about GP, how many members, Dr. Sunita? 
4,000 members, such a non great reach for you people. And if we can do that, we, we organize beautiful conferences, everything. So very basic things that can be messaged. What do you think? Yeah, very much. <coughs> yes. Okay, so we'll go back to first gastroenteritis and then entry fee. Uh, Dr. Pankaj was asking, how does one know whether it is viral, amoebic or bacterial gastroenteritis? Or food intolerance? So, food or intolerance, there will be a classical uh, history of consumption of, say, like uh, cheese, cakes, uh, then uh, your Chinese food. So, I think there will be a very classical history of them. Many of them are self-limiting, uh, especially uh, bacillus serious and all that. They, you know, your uh, symptoms start within two to three hours of consumption of the food, and uh, within uh, 24 hours it subsides also. So these are self-limiting usually, but those which persist beyond 24 hours usually will be more likely to be an associated with fever will be more likely to be associated either with Shigella or uh, Campylobacter and all that. So these uh, they, these are the uh, possibly GI infections which requires to be uh, treated. Otherwise, many of them would be self-limiting, uh, and bacterial diarrhea usually will be uh, uh, in abdominal pain, fever will be accompanying the picture. In viral diarrhea, I think it's more commonly seen in the uh, children uh, rather than adults. I would say uh, more likely to be uh, in seen in uh, children than adults. So adults uh, is more likely to be bacteria, either it's self-limiting or it could be uh, if it goes on beyond 24 hours or something, then you know you may require, uh, if there's associated fever or there's a blood in you know stools, uh, cramping, tenesmus, uh, vomiting persistent, uh, tachycardia, then possibly it goes more in favor of bacterial DCMP. Whereas uh, viral diarrhea is uh, usually, uh, and the color of the stool also sometimes may be useful to tell you like, you know, uh, you know greenish, then it's more likely to be shigella like, you know, uh, illness. I think viral diarrhea is adults uh, slightly less likely to have, but uh, they will not be so sick that they will not be associated with usually high fever, or usually with abdominal cramping pains and all that. They are usually self-limiting. And uh, normally they subside in 20, 48 hours. More seen in immunocompromised patients, viral diarrhea, rather than immunocompetent uh, person. And coming to the amoebic, amoebic is, as I said, they will not be associated with fever. They will come with flatulence, abdominal discomfort, which is going on for, off and on for more than a week or two weeks. The history is slightly prolonged. But any acute diarrhea, uh, you know, they will give you a very classic history. Yesterday I had eaten uh, in this hotel or I had gone for the marriage and or I had eaten fish here or I had eaten prawns here or crabs there and or I had, had eaten Chinese food. They will give you a very classic history. And that is usually associated with food poison and the commonest organism here could be likely to be shigella like the pathogens or really correct. What is your drug of choice for what looks like febrile acute bacillary disease? I, that's what am I, I, I use ciprofloxacin 500 million twice a day for people. Just like in traveler's area, here Similar. also cipro would be the first choice. So that is it. one area where I use a short course and so I have seen other therapies not working well and I don't use it combination at all or I don't use two drugs at all. So it's, uh, and I am giving you 100% saying that use only single drugs, it will work perfectly well. My thought process about cipro was that we know that salmonella in entry is resistant to quinolones. We know that E. coli is resistant to quinolones and E. coli salmonella becomes the major gastroenteritis drugs. Do you think still Cipro will work? It works because yeah. uh, here the E. coli for some reason they are, uh, you know, it's uh, Cipro sensitive. Rather than what you can use is azithromycin. But azithromycin sometimes again because it will work for Campylobacter jejuni also. Mm. But azithromycin sometimes itself can cause uh, yeah, but the alternative drug is to use doxycycline. Catacycline is an excellent drug. So I think the drugs to use will be cipro, doxycycline, or uh, using azithromycin. Cepixin will also be work, but cepixin 400 twice a day you can use that. Bactrim is also a good drug. Yes, you can use Bactrim also in the clinic. Sorry? Sorry, two people are talking. Yeah, three days should be good. No, yeah. G6PD. 
Hey, I, normally I always ask them, are you allergic to sulfur or something? But I'm not using Bactrim for, uh, you know, diarrhea, where you have some alternative drugs because if the patient is allergic to sulfur and all that, then you will end up with another problem. So do you do G6PD before Cotinoxifal? Uh, you do G6PD before Cotinoxifal? Uh, not a routine. routine, routine, okay. routine, routine, routine. Do you use rifaximin for acute gastroenteritis? I am not using rifaximin. Only patients who come to me with chronic uh, uh, irritable bowel syndrome or uh, those who have this uh, acute and chronic diarrhea which is going on, maybe the GI flora is wiped out and all that. So in that possibly, there in those patients I use the probiotics, uh, probiotics and maybe rifaximin like this. Okay. Rifaximin dose duration is so I use it for no. anywhere from uh, you know seven to ten days at least. I have to use it. The short course may not work, so I use it for seven to ten days. But again, uh, not a very common uh, drug on my okay. uh, Now we go to enteric fever. Uh, we will not discuss diagnosis of enteric fever, except in one area. Uh, I make them take a vow usually about on Vidal, that, that even at the cost of my life, I will not do a Vidal test. <laughs> so, uh, I will not talk about Vidal, but what about Typhidot? So, Typhidot, uh, if, you have, if at all you have to do it within the first three days, uh, so, uh, you know, but negative does not rule out at all. And positive would confirm if the, the way it is going on, the, fever, the pattern of the fever. So if at all you have to do it in the first 72 hours, uh, uh, either you have to, by, because by the time the patient comes to me for, uh, you know, typhoid treatment, it is usually beyond 5 to 7 days and must have received some other the antibiotics. So I, I still persist to do the blood cultures and uh, I would say 70% of the times I am correct by getting the blood cultures come positive. Huh. So oh. that, uh, that is one thing. Second thing is, Otherwise, I treat uh, uh, typhoid on clinical basis. So, I say it's clinical typhoid because there's no way once a patient receives some antibiotics, how can you get your blood cultures, uh, you know, positive. So, I'll give you a case scenario. Day 7, patient comes to you and uh, day, say day 6, the patient comes to you with fever, persistent fever, and then 3, and then 4. So, what are the possibilities? Either it could be dengue or community acquired fever or it could be lepto or it could be uh, uh, scrub typhus, or it could be malaria, or it could be enteric fever. Okay, He's talking about fever where there are no localizing symptoms like respiratory or during night. Yeah. So in that case, uh, many, um, because the uh, enteric topic is coming, you know, that's what I'm So by day 6, if it's dengue, uh, you will come to know from the platelet count, at least there may be a dip. Not that every 100% dengue will have thrombocytopenia as a between you. But uh, that is what. Uh, but you will have at least your WBC count on the lower side. Uh, if it is malaria, thrombocytopenia will be there definitely. Or there will be neutrophilia like what has been uh, seen. Then scrub typhus or leptospirosis definitely there will be leukocytosis. Or if there is normal, higher side normal WBC count with lower platelet count. Okay. But when it comes to uh, typhoid by day 6, day 7, you will have a normal CBC. Okay, normal CBC, normal platelet count, normal plate, WBC will be 4,000, 5,000, okay, and what will be more striking is you have to look for the eosinophils, eosinophilia, so that is one thing, and your liver enzymes will be around 70, 80, so, but that 70, 80 will happen in all, malaria, scrub, lepto, dengue, so that all the faces look same, sabka chera is just a it is very difficult to make out what it is, so, after day 7, day 8, you know, dengue is out because dengue cannot be more than 7 days. And malaria, lepto, it, it could have been evident from the CBC. So then you have made your diagnosis that this, and another marker which will help you is CRP. CRP will be slightly on the higher side in enteric fever. <coughs> your spleen will be just palpable. It will be a soft uh, spleen which is palpable compared to the firm uh, spleen in uh, malaria which is there. So it will be soft spleen palpable. The other clues for enteric fever will be patients having continuous fever. Every six hourly is requiring a paracetamol. Headache will be accompanying fever. Uh, they may come to you with uh, diarrhea or loose motion. Maybe in the beginning, one or two days and then it stops or they may start with diarrhea later on, day seven, day eight. 
but the CBCs are usually rock stable. So day seven, day eight, also CBC is normal. So you have made your mind that this looks like a typhoid. So what? Huh? 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 Huh?
we are not seeing chlorophyll we are seeing chlorophyll chemical around what 100% resistance which we were seeing earlier now we are seeing around 20% the isolate still uh, sensitive to sensitive. Okay. but uh, you have to have a sensitivity report uh, but you know uh, giving parax uh, that is using chlorophenicol in absence of culture may not be a good idea a uh, good idea would be to use cefexin at least you know ki it will definitely work if it is salmonella but uh, chlorophenicol may or may not work uh, if it's salmonella if it is a resistant salmonella so i will go with cefexin or maybe azithromycin but i'm more comfortable with cefexin it's pinded twice a day for 5 days dose of azithromycin pinded minimum twice a day for 5 days a clone fang or other objection might be the bone marrow bone uh, marrow suppression so i'm not i'm not using we have options so but trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is a drug definitely drug. excellent drug protein this protein this can we use two drugs for single I'm drug like again i'm saying in your clinical practice use single drug don't use combination therapies it will not work combination therapy is only for endocarditis for example you know single use uh, or multi drug resistant pathogens in the icus where you require uh, combination therapy okay. it is uh, around 5 to 10 mg of the trimethoprim so uh, one double strength uh, of trimethoprim uh, say like bactrim gs is 960 mg ka hai usme 800 is sulfamethoxazole and 160 is trimethoprim so it is say patient is 60 kg Okay, so you'll give around say uh, five milligram per kg body weight. So five six at thirty. So three sixty milligram you require. So one tablet contains one sixty. So you'll give at least one one TDS. Three twenty, huh? So you'll use uh, uh, you can use it one three times around five to ten milligram per. So I would say I would use one three times a day back in days. IgM. If somebody sends the uh, IgM, पहले तीन दिन में किसी ने भेजा तो ही. After five seven days. Uh, so she is just comparing it to dengue, for example. Dengue IgM comes positive after four five days. Does typhoid IgM? No, typhoid IgM comes, comes positive in the first, just like brucella also, ना? The brucella IgM comes positive in first three five days and disappears. Similarly, uh, typhoid. I will I will still go on clinical or blood blood cultures. Uh, Again, that is your test. We can uh, for some reason uh, I'm not uh, on my pen at all. I'm not. I don't remember writing to a single patient IgM typhoid. I only get reports from others. But uh, if you ask me, either I treat clinically. I'm very confident in treating. Only confident in the diagnosis that I treat, or I do blood cultures. The blood cultures may be negative, but I. Stick to my diagnosis, but I have to watch that I'm not missing out on anything. Mm-hmm. So if your cultures are negative, then you have to be very watchful that you're not de- losing, uh, not missing of meningitis, you're not missing a, uh, you know, pleural effusion, not missing miliary TB, not missing mediastinal TB. So all that is very important if your culture is negative. Suppose your culture is negative on day three. Suppose I have admitted somebody, okay, thinking that uh, I've sent his blood cultures, blood cultures are negative. WBC count is normal. Okay, and the fever is 103 persistent on day three, day four. I have to, I have to look for you know at least the CRP. If suppose it is 90, after three days the CRP should at least should start trending down. Something has to be there. I cannot just stick to my diagnosis. Then it's a typhoid. Here. It may not turn out to be typhoid. It may turn out to be lymphoma. So then you know the so you have to be very sure about uh, when your cultures are negative, but not miss out on other possibilities. So you may have normal WBC count in many conditions, na? Normal WBC you will have in lymphoma, you will have in miliary TB, you will have in mediastinal TB, you will have in brucella. So you lupus, you know, systemic lupus erythematosus. So you can have that. So uh, like I had one patient in uh, this nursing home where the patient got came, admitted with the NS1 CAT test positive, and I thought it's but the CBC was not matching with the uh, that ending diagnosis at all. So I sent blood cultures, everything. Everything came negative. Then she had lymph nodes in the neck. So we did uh, further investigations. You know, thinking it's tuberculosis. We got a biopsy done, and finally it turned out to be lupus. And she was in the hospital for almost two weeks for that whole thing. And uh, we started with steroids, 
uh, and after steroids, you know, next day she spiked 104 fever. So then I was completely taken aboard. Ki, what is happening, you know? So I was really panicked at that moment. Ki, given steroid, which I normally don't give at all, but I gave with confidence that the ANA came as one is to a 4 plus positive. DSD was negative, lymph node, reactive lymph node. So classically fitting into lupus, young girl. And uh, then the fever was not going. And, uh, you know, the only thing which the subsequent leg is the NS1 antigen came positive and the ferritin came positive. So she got dengue in the hospital of the mosquito bite because of staying for 14, day, 14 days. So the, the SLE was a definitive diagnosis for what she got admitted. And then she got dengue because of the mosquito bite in the hospital. So that also you have to keep in mind sometimes if you have a patient at least in the lower floors, open wards, uh, mosquito bites, first yeah. floor, second floor, so it's common. Okay. Uh, So, uh, yeah, yeah, the fever defervescence after four or five days, no, it will never disappear suddenly. It will be a, uh, it will take, so I always tell my patient, the defervescence, the fever to start defervescing will take five 